Excellent. Hello. Thank you for being with me today. I'm excited to have you here. Again, it's wonderful to see familiar names and new names on the webinar list. And as we are populating on Instagram, it's good to see some familiar names there as well. I am so glad you are with me today. Today we are doing a really solid introduction to the three foundational constitutions of constitutional iridology. And that means we're going to be looking at blue eyes, brown eyes, and hazel eyes. First, we need to do the little disclaimer. This information is meant for your education only. It's not meant to diagnose or prescribe, and you are responsible for any results, good or bad, that result from using this information. Got it? Good. Welcome. I would just love it if you would take a moment to, in the chat box or in the comments, just let me know uh, who you are and where you're from. Hi, Yoga Detox. Good to see you on Instagram. Thanks for joining us there. And but if you're with me on the webinar live, I would love to know where you're from and maybe a little bit about you. Especially, I would love to know if you are a holistic health practitioner. Are you a herbalist or a nutritionist or a massage therapist? I know we've got a physiotherapist on the webinar with us. Um, that would certainly count. Are you a naturopath? What do you have? We've got a holistic nutritionist from Ottawa. Hi, Pam. Pamela, it's good to see you. Thanks for being with us today. And just knowing who I've got with me helps me to tweak things a little bit and I can slant the information a little more to my audience. We've got yoga detox retreat in Mexico. Woo, nice place to do a yoga detox retreat. Sounds good. I'll be right down. Um, and we have got Joanne from uh, Quebec. She's also a registered holistic nutritionist. Excellent. Great. So we can slant since the nutritionists are weighing in and yoga. And like I said, I know we've got a physiotherapist on with us. I can slant this a little bit in those directions to make our time more useful. Robin says she's getting back into her naturopathic practitioner work and certifying as a CSCS. Woo, Robin, go you. And Robin, you're back in Airdrie. Wow, okay. Now, what is a CSCS? I'm not familiar with that, so just let me know what that is. We're gonna get rolling here. This is awesome, this is fabulous. So I would like to take a moment and introduce myself. We've got a detox specialist with us on Instagram. Fabulous, okay. We're gonna be talking about a lot of that. Robin says CSCS is strength and conditioning certification. Fabulous, wonderful. Okay, so let's look at um, I, I want to introduce myself, right? Some of you know, have known me for years and some of you um, are new to me. And so just by way of introduction, my name is Judith Cobb. I'm a master herbalist, natural nutrition clinical practitioner, certified iridologist and certified iridology instructor. I have been uh, studying since 1979. I started my practice in 1980. So I have been at this, I look at the calendar, which is dumb. I know I've been at this for 40 years now. It's pretty amazing stuff. We've got Natasha with us, who is also a holistic detox health coach. Wonderful, Natasha. Good to have you with us. I'm also the wife of one, the mom of seven, and the grandma of eight. So as we go through this today, what I'm sharing with you is stuff that I learned um, partway through my training, right? And I'm, I'll explain that in a minute. But I also created my business while I was having and raising seven children. We are down to one child left at home and she's 21 and we know what her plans are. So she's welcome to stay for another year or two. And then I think we're gonna boot her out. And so um, I, I will tell you though that it, with all that training, it took some work to figure things out. I'd studied one style of iridology had been there for about 10 years, was getting frustrated because what they were telling me I would see wasn't happening. They told me I would see color changes in the irides. I, they told me I would see fiber structure changes in the irides. And after 10 years of putting people on cleanses and detoxes and supplements and lifestyle changes, I didn't see any changes at all. So I was about ready to slam the door on iridology when I learned about constitutional iridology. And that got really exciting for me because it really resonated with with what I wanted to accomplish with my clients. And it really made a difference for me. 
it also helped me to integrate other things that I knew. When I, the first style of iridology was very much, I see this, 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 this in your eyes. That means you've got these problems. That means you've got to do all these things. And it was overwhelming for me. It was overwhelming for my clients and it wasn't working as well as I didn't see the changes I was told I would see. And so constitutional taught me to focus on my client first. What are my client's needs? What are my client's goals? What are their symptoms? How do the eyes inform me? How do they help me understand why my client has these symptoms? And then knowing that, finding out what my client is already doing with it, about it, because of it, and from there, using that as my launch point for creating the, the next steps program and taking my client one step at a time rather than vomiting everything I knew over them, hoping they could sort it out, right? So this is what I'm going to show you today is going to be the foundation for how to build into doing iridology, the constitutional holistic way. When we do it this way, what, what you are going to find is that um, it will help you to do a faster assessment if you're already a practitioner. It's going to help you to be way more accurate because you're not going to be telling the client what's wrong with them. You're going to have a conversation with them and use their eyes to point you in the right direction. It's going to help you build better and faster rapport with your clients. Now, some clients are kind of, they've got a thick shell. And the way you break through that thick shell is to really get into them and to be focusing so totally on them rather than working in generalities. And I find that when I'm doing it this way, I really do break through that thick shell. And by the end of our first hour together, my appointments are typically an hour long, I find that I'm able to to really get information from them and I'm really able to communicate with them in a way that's resonating with them. And that's really important. So many of them by the end of the first hour are saying, I don't know how you did that, but I've just told you things I've never told anybody else. And it's like, well, I just, I am just talking with you. That's it. We are resonating together. The other thing that I love about iridology this way is it eliminates the need for an intake form. You still need your release form, you know, your informed consent, your waiver, whatever you want to call it. But this gets rid of those multi-page intake forms that waste client time. They waste your time. They're too general. They don't really laser you in on what needs to be done. You ready? Should we look at our first eye? You ready? Yeah, yeah. This is our first eye type. This is a lymphatic iris. You would call it a blue eye if you have no iridology background, and that's exactly why you're here. We call it lymphatic. When we are looking at a lymphatic iris, there are some key indicators that we always look for. The first thing is there will always be some blue. Now, it may not always be this beautiful violet blue. It may not always be baby blue. We're gonna look at another example where you go, that's a blue eye. And it's like, yep, it is. So we're always gonna have some blue. We're always going to see some fiber. To see these threads that are sitting in this eye, this is what we call fiber. Technically they're called trabeculae, but we simplify that to fiber because it's so much easier to say. And so we will always see some fiber. We might have other colors sitting in this blue iris. When we see a lymphatic iris, we know that the common health concerns for this eye type center around the mucous membranes, the acid levels in the body, and, uh, and their lymphatic system. Hello, uh, Chick Kimberly. It's good to see you on Instagram. Thanks for being there. What we see here is then that predisposition, the eye, the iris is inherent. This is genetic. This is showing us how this person's body is built and what they've inherited from the past three to four generations. Okay, this, the iris structure, the basic color is not going to change. That's a really important thing to know with constitutional iridology. It's not going to change. Common health concerns then specifically, some examples, asthma, allergies, arthritis, eczema, and psoriasis, kidney issues. So when I give you that list, I'm not saying they will have those things. I'm saying there is a greater 
predisposition towards those things. And as you, if you know your anatomy and your physiology, you understand. And if you know some of your pathologies, you understand that all of those, those symptoms, which asthma, allergies, arthritis, eczema, psoriasis, kidney issues, those are all symptoms are all circling around the concept of the body being over acid. So the lymphatic constitution wants to be over acid, not the best thing to wanna to be, but it wants to be over acid. Now, because they tend to be over acid by diet choice, by poor digestion, poor um, breakdown of, of food stuffs, and then the way their body deals with that inefficient breakdown, we often see that they tend to have calcium assimilation issues and they will sometimes even have thyroid parathyroid imbalances as well so when we are looking at a lymphatic iris we are going to ask questions about personal and family history of so your client comes into you and the first thing they're going to do is give you what i call the shopping list the things that they want help with and that's going to tip you off a little bit already as to what direction you need to be going when you look at their eyes, if you see that it's a uh, very clear or a lymphatic eye of any type, then you know that if they've brought in any inflammatory situations, any mucous membrane situations, any low immune situations, that you are really on the right track, that those things all tie in beautifully. So in this particular iris that you're looking at right now, we see a predisposition towards reduced stomach acid issues digesting protein potentially so now this client may have figured this out a long time ago right they might have figured out that heavy animal proteins don't digest well so they're choosing to be use lighter proteins and be more vegan so they might not have obvious symptoms but we know from looking at their eye that what we're seeing here is we recognize the different signs that that is their predisposition and that's why they've had to go to altering their diet our goal then is to help them rebuild and support that area so they don't have to have a limited diet okay does that make sense so we see this again predisposition towards reduced stomach acid towards problems potentially breaking down proteins and assimilating nutrients we also see the possible family history here of some blood sugar imbalances. And again, when we're doing this, we're not looking for one marking equals one problem. We're looking for how do these marks play together? And when they're together, what story do they tell us? It's not a one for one thing. This isn't an allopathic kind of a, an approach to things. It's very holistic. We see also um, a little bit of a predisposition towards excess mucus and acid in the body. And that of course can translate into so many different symptoms, right? We could see sinus issues or the asthma, allergies, arthritis, skin conditions, because again, those are all acid imbalances. We see also some predispositions towards issues with eliminating through the skin. So that would tie into the high acid. We would want to then very specifically ask about eczema and psoriasis. And it might be that we temporarily do some dietary work, some detox work, some diet refinement temporarily while we get their body coming around and, and functioning better. The goal here is not to keep limiting diet, it's to understand their body, how to support it so we can broaden out their diet in healthful ways, right? Does that all make sense? If this is making sense, give me a thumbs up or give me an, oh yeah, just let me know that this is landing for you. Okay, uh, we also see that in this eye, we see some indications of this body wanting to mess up its carbohydrate metabolism. And Joanne says, yes, it's landing great. Thank you, Joanne, I really appreciate that. We, we see also here the possibility that there might be a B3 deficiency. We see some inherent potential again for poor circulation in this body. But again, we have to be looking at all of these things together as a puzzle. It's, you know, if you've got one piece of the puzzle, you don't see the picture, do you? You need all the pieces of the puzzle, or at least most of them to see the picture. So these again are only predispositions. And that means we have to have that conversation with the client. This is where we build the rapport because now we're asking questions that are specific to our client's situation. We're not asking broad general questions at all. We're being laser specific. 
So in our conversation, again, we're going to need to understand what their actual symptoms are, um, how long they've had the symptoms, have they noticed anything that relieves them, you know, the typical kinds of questions. We also need to know what are they doing about them, and we need to be able to trace things back. That's the beauty of iridology. We can take that symptom, and as you already know, the symptom is not the problem, right? The pain is not the problem. The symptom is usually the pain. The problem is usually much deeper, and we need to go in and correct that in order to fix the symptoms. So we're always working back to find the root. Sometimes we need to offer a Band-Aid to buy us time. We need to do something to make the, the client comfortable while we're doing the deep work. And then as we know that the deep work is being done, we can back the Band-Aid away. And it's a case where we don't rip it off quickly. <laughs> we take it off slowly because we want to make sure that things are working the way they're supposed to. Is this all making sense so far? If it is, let me know. Let me know that this is working for you. Let's look at a different lymphatic iris. This lymphatic iris, remember we said that a lymphatic iris must always have some blue, and this eye has some very blue-gray, sort of a almost a gunmetal gray in here, which counts as a, a shade of blue. And we've got lots of fiber visible here. We've got lots of other color overlaid in this iris, right? This is still a lymphatic iris. What we know from here, we're gonna, we would look at fiber structure that gives us lots more information beyond the blue. We look at the other colors in here, each of these colors, and where that color is located gives us even more information about where this person is prone to having imbalances. Even looking at things like this specific pigment gives us more information. And then beyond there, we can actually begin looking at the sclera. So the iris, again, is inherent. This is what you got from your parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and possibly your great-great-grandparents. The sclera is what you've done to yourself, and the cornea, which is the layer of tissue that is in front of the iris. So if we've got the iris here and the eyeballs looking this way. There's that clear layer here. In, right in front of the iris, it also can change with time. And so we know that there are changes and we know that we create those changes by our diet, our lifestyle, our thought processes, things like that, but we don't change the actual iris structure itself. So again, our common health concerns here focus around the mucous membranes, the immune system, the acid levels in the body, uh, we may need to focus a little bit on thyroid parathyroid imbalances as well with this eye type because that over acid predisposition can burn through your calcium pretty quickly. And when you burn through your calcium, that's going to create some issues for thyroid parathyroid. So this one, again, tells us, this eye tells us that this person is more prone, again, to some digestive upsets that are rooted in liver issues or liver imbalances, potential liver imbalances. And we see from that that we may need to do some support with some digestive enzymes. We may all, we see also in here, based on the different pigments, that there's that predisposition towards kidney imbalance. So that's a double, I call it a double whammy. That is not a highly technical term, just so you know. Um, and what that means is this lymphatic iris, we know they're already predisposed to kidney acid issues. But when we have a kidney pigment as well, that's two things saying kidneys can be at risk. Kidneys may not want to do their job all the way. So then we need to be thinking, okay, what are we going to do to help the kidneys do their job? Well, we might want to be doing some different kinds of food support, right? We can think about what foods are hard on the kidneys. Well, heavy proteins are hard on the kidneys. What foods are supportive for the kidneys? Well, that would be things like your leafy greens and especially things like parsley and cilantro can be very helpful for the kidneys. Celery is great for the kidneys as well. And so we can start pulling in what we know about diet, what we know about nutritional herbs. Like we could use some marshmallow root here. Very gentle, we can use it for a very long term. Hi, yes, whatever, good to see you on Instagram with us. 
And so we can begin with this as we, we start looking at the rice, we can start creating in our mind those short lists of what would we do with foods? What would we do with supplements? And these are the things that we're necessarily going to teach our client about. But we're starting the thought process of where could I go? Where does the client need this to go? And as we continue to ask the questions, we can shorten that list, shorten that list, shorten that list until it is a laser focused list that will take our client from where they are now up one level. And we're always just thinking about what is the next step. We're not thinking about what is the end result. Well, we are, we are, we got to know where we're going, right? But we're doing it one step at a time so that our client can manage this very, very successfully. Does that make sense to break this down into little pieces so our client can, can just do the next step, achieve success, do the next step, be successful and keep building. Does that work for you? Is that something that you think would be good for your clients? So when we look at this eye again, um, we see we've got this strong liver predisposition with some of the brown coloring that's in the middle of it. We've got some kidney predisposition with some of the oat straw coloring. And again, we're starting to pull in lots of, of different concepts in our brain or on our notes that we keep for ourselves so that we have a roadmap of where, where we need to go with this client to help them achieve their health goals. We need to remember that our goals might be different than, from theirs. Right, of course, we always want our clients to all have perfect health, but if someone is bogged down with a particular health concern, they're not thinking perfect health, they're thinking get rid of this problem. And so we need to stay on track with what our client wants from us and what they want for their goals. Does that make sense? Sometimes I find holistic practitioners get carried away. This is what one of my naturopathic students said. Um, she had already taken iridology as a part of her naturopathic studies by the time she got to me. And this is what she said about the course that I teach. Judith's course, Confident Nutritionist, I've changed the name to Dynamic Iridology Assessment Technique, surpassed my previous training in structure, content, delivery, documentation, and support. Iridology has certainly reduced the time required for prioritizing a treatment plan. What I've seen far too many holistic practitioners do is they see the client, then they go off for two or three hours or four hours or six hours, I had one person tell me 20 hours, to create a treatment protocol for the client they didn't get paid for those hours, then they bring it back a few weeks later to the client if the client even comes back, right? And so, um, and that's a waste of time, an absolute abject total waste of time. So what we look at here is um, that, that Sharon Bimrose, naturopath from Australia says, iridology without a doubt has been a huge game changer in my practice. So that's very, very cool. Let's look at the next eye type, ready? This is the brown eye. Now, you call it brown, I call it hematogenic. When we think of hematogenic, what does hema make you think of hema? I'd like to see that in the comments or in the, the chat. I'm gonna wait for you to say that while I go on and talk about um, some of the features before I tell you where, where it goes. So these people have no fiber visible in their eyes. There is so much pigment in their eyes in what is called the anterior border layer or uh, the, yeah, the anterior border layer. There's so much pigment there that it totally masks everything. Gold star, Robin, good job. Blood is hema, absolutely. And we're gonna come back to that in a moment. Thank you for putting that in there, love it. And so these people have so much pigment that it masks everything. It masks all the fiber structure. So there's no visible fiber, there's no blue, there's no green, we just see brown. Now you look at this eye and you see there's golds in here and you see these lines coming around here. So the golds give us some information, these lines give us some information, but we are not seeing the individual threads radiating outwards. So as Robin so aptly commented, uh, commented there, when we see someone who's got a hematogenic eye, S whatever, yes, you said blood as well, good job. Love that, thanks on Instagram. What we, what we know here is these people's key areas that we want to be watching are their blood and their liver. Again, going back to your anatomy and physiology, you know that yes, blood cells originate in the marrow, but blood, the uh, maturation and the iron storage and things like that 
a lot of that comes out of the liver. So we need to make sure that we are paying a prone again to issues with stomach digestion because liver has a huge impact on stomach and digestion. Circulation and heart, varicose veins, they tend to be a little more alkaline. And so that, from that perspective, we need a certain amount of calcium to add, or a certain amount of acid to get our calcium. If we're too alkaline, we can't get our calcium. If we don't get enough calcium, it messes up our metabolism. It messes up all of the endocrine. And so we really need to be watching them for how their endocrine system is functioning. Now, a lot of people think that these brown eyes are hard to read because you don't see the fiber, but we need to remember the fiber is only one thing we're looking at. This iris suggests so many things. It's actually exciting when you understand how to read a brown or hematogenic eye, because this, this particular eye suggests some issues with po possibly with absorbing nutrients. The eye actually is telling us this person is a bit of an introvert, which is going to impact how you communicate with them a little bit, right? Introverts tend to like things that are more quiet. They tend to um, be more introspective, more pensive. They like good communication. They tend to not waste words and breath on chit chat. So that gives you information on how to connect with this person. If you've got an extrovert, you can be louder. You can be bigger. You can be bigger. An introvert, you want to be smaller and more direct. You want to match their energy when you're communicating with them. Otherwise, they're going to shut you out. You're going to be too much for them. This, this also, this eye tells us that this person um, likely has a bowel that functions on a little bit of a tight schedule, maybe dries things out. So they maybe have what we call rabbit turds, you know, little balls of poop rather than having a formed stool. This person has an inherent predisposition to functioning in the sympathetic nervous system most of the time. So back to your A and P, what do you know about the sympathetic nervous system? What does that mean for how they respond to stress? When we understand that about this person, then we understand what impact could that be having on their symptoms? Or is the sympathetic nervous system, that sympathetic response actually causing some of their symptoms, right? When I see people that have a lot of these, I'm seeing this more and more, we see so much more anxiety and depression. Like 40 years ago, we didn't see anxiety and depression the way we do now. Now I would bet that 70% of my clients have, have been clinically diagnosed with anxiety or depression. And so many of my clients have these rings going around their eyes. The rings don't guarantee anxiety or depression. It tells us how the body works with the nutrients that can regulate or have an impact on anxiety and depression. So it means that we can more accurate, accurately um, feed and nourish our clients through foods and through supplements to help them mitigate and balance their body out. This person also, uh, because of those, those rings that tell us that she tends to function in the sympathetic nervous system, we know she burns through her B vitamins, her vitamin C, her calcium and magnesium at record speed, and even faster when the stress is on. Does that give you clues, those of you with nutrition background or herbal background or other backgrounds, does that give you clues as to the kinds of things you want to think about teaching this client about? Yeah, things like take time to meditate or go for a quiet walk, get rid of the coffee because of how it depletes your B vitamins and your calcium and things like that. Her eyes also say she likes to be busy. She likes to accomplish things. She has to-do lists. That's very common a trait with eyes like this. They like to have their to-do list. Bit of a perfectionist. If she doesn't get through the whole list all in one day, she's disappointed in her performance. And so we need to coach her to be gentler with herself, to realize that what's on her list would take 10 people, 10 days to accomplish. Why does she think she can do it as one person in one day, right? Even though her eyes are brown and they tend to, they're less prone to being over acidic, this person wants to keep um, pushing her, or her body wants to keep pushing her to be that way. And we see indications in here that even though she is, her 
overall her body wants to be more alkaline. Her body also has those little things that say, no, you don't, you wanna to be too acidic. Come on, let's be too acidic. Just try it for a minute, right? And so again, we need to keep working with her foods, her diet, her lifestyle. Her eyes suggest that her liver doesn't like to metabolize carbohydrates properly. And that, um, that's actually a corn, corneal marker. It's in the cornea of the iris, or of the eye, not in the iris itself. So can you think of some dietary changes that you would make for someone who tends to burn through their B vitamins too fast? Oh, there's also markers in here that suggest she probably, she's likely prone to having the, the MTHFR defect, if you're familiar with that. And so knowing all these things that she's prone to stress, that she probably has very tight bowels and has rabbit poops, she may have problems processing her carbs. What are some things that you would recommend she do? What are some things that you might want to suggest for her? I'd love to see some comments on that one, right? Uh, the mental characteristics tie into many things, uh, yoga. So we look at these rings coming around the eyes. We look at how they're accentuated with the radiating black lines that come out. We look at this pigment right here. We look at the fact that she's got this corneal arcus. Those things all play together to give us some clues as to her mental characteristics and how well she handles stress and all that kind of stuff. So it's not that there's necessarily just one marker. We have to understand how all the markers play together, right? So what are some dietary things that you would do? We've got some nutritionists with us. I wanna know, what would you suggest here? Maybe she needs lemon for her detox. Could be, could be. She might need to do some detox. I don't, I'm not big on detoxing people the way I used to be. I tend to be much more um, on the line of let's build the nutrition on the positives and let's crowd out the negatives. I find that most people, it, when they used to do a detox, wouldn't come off them properly because you don't go from detox to full diet in 24 hours and people get impatient and it undoes all the good they've just done. So I tend to not do much with detox. All right, any, any other dietary suggestions? What do you like to do when, you're, when you've got someone who you know is focus, uh, functions in high stress? What do you do? More vegetables. Yeah, I love the more ve vegetables and, a meat, and more meat-based diet. So we're going for protein balance there, aren't we? To balance the blood sugars. Yeah. And then in addition to that, with what we see in her eyes, I'm going to want to give her some support in digesting those meats because she's not going to be strong on them. She needs the full protein, but she needs help digesting it. And so deep leafy greens, wild herbs of, of Arizona. Yes, deep leafy greens, good thing to suggest. That's going to pick up the B vitamins in the methylated form right there. That's going to help if she has some MTHFR. If you know about MTHFR, you know that one of the common symptoms is they also tend to end up with depression and anxiety if it's not balanced out. All right, you want to look at another brown eye? Yeah, yeah? Let me know. I want to know. Brown eye? Or should we go on to hazel? What do you think? Another one? Or either one? <laughs> oh, it's easy. Either one. Well, let's do another brown eye. Because this one is entirely different. Do you see all the different texturing in here? All the different shapes? This is still a brown eye. But when we see this again, and we know that it's completely brown, we've got the same kind of rings going around, so we know we're gonna burn through B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium very quickly. We've got some other wild herbs. We will get to hazel, I promise you. Uh, when we see this, we, we also have an, some indicators that suggest MTHFR could be a risk here as well. And we've got some indicators of a predisposition towards poor circulation. But we need to ask, we don't know that the circulation is poor. Maybe this person is really doing a great job of diet and lifestyle and the circulation, circulation is great. So we need to ask them, we don't wanna be teaching them what they already know, but we do want to be giving them a pat on the back. You know, you work out for 45 minutes a day, good on you, that is great, please keep doing that. What else are you doing that's good for your body? Right, and we need to be encouraging them to maintain whatever their positives already are. 
So with this one, again, we see that um, we've got a couple of markers uh, pointing to some kidney issues, potentially. We've got the risk of some endocrine stuff going on as well. We know that when people have the endocrine markers, they are typically very creative. So we want to find out, are they actually honoring that? Because if they're not, it's going to throw them towards blood sugar issues. I know that that might sound disconnected, but it's one of those emotional things that we work on. And so we're going to, again, need to be, because they have the brown eyes, we know liver and blood, we've got to support the liver. And we've got to make sure that we are also targeting their particular things. And with this person, we needed to be working on balancing their carbs, making sure they had enough protein to keep their blood sugars stable and working from there. Let's see what one, one more of my students said. This is Karen Cho. She came to me as a well-trained um, holistic health practitioner specializing in gut health. She specifically said when I asked her how had I, learning iridology helped her in her practice, she said it helped her to understand the relationships between different organs and organ systems more in depth. Iridology also gives me an advantage of seeing the potential for different genetic traits and qualities that may be underlying by observing the constitution. For example, you can, uh, under, you can extrapolate how the person's body will likely respond to applications of healing methods. Therefore, it's helped me to expand my knowledge and increased efficiency at providing more precise recommendations for health-oriented options. So get your work done in your client sessions. All right, biliary. So herbs of, of uh, Arizona, here we are for you. This is the biliary eye. Now, many of you would look at that and go, it's brown. And I'm going, no, it's not. Absolutely not. So... In old school iridology, what I did for the first 10 years of my practice, I would have said, this person is full of fill in the blank. They need a deep cleanse. They are toxic. Those eyes should be blue. We now know that's not right. Hello all as well. Good to see you. And so what we now know is that this is inherent. This is genetic. This is not an indication of toxicity. We see that we've got mixed coloration here. There is no actual blue. So that means it can't be lymphatic. We do have visible fibers, which means it can't be hematogenic. That means it's biliary. Okay, so no blue, some fibers. We might see some green, we might see some gold, we might see some white, particularly in these rings. We will often see that. We'll often see lots of golden highlights in these it'll often be darker around the pupil. So when we see this type of an eye, we know that our questions need to center around personal and family history of digestion, of liver. We've got the brown in there, brown is always about liver. Gallbladder, because those two are like this. And pancreas, for those of you on Instagram, those two are like this, there we go. And so, um, inherent potentials here, particularly with this eye, more prone to poor digestion. So we needed to work with the idea of simplifying the meals, having them not be so busy, two or three key ingredients and that's all. We needed to get them to have smaller meals, to chew their food well, and we needed to get them to focus on leafy greens again to support the liver and the alkalizing side of things. The inherent potential here again is to have the rabbit turds, to not have good bowel movements because of how we're seeing certain things lining up here. Again, sympathetic undercurrent. And specifically in this iris, we see the potential of issues with iron metabolism. Now we don't know if this is anemia or if it's hemochromatosis. And so we're not gonna to touch that with a 10 foot pole. We're actually gonna send them back to their doctor to get some labs done so we understand what their hemoglobin, what their serum, um, iron, what their ferritin are doing so that we don't mess things up on them. Because if they've got hemochromatosis and we pump them full of iron, we are killing their liver and it's not a good thing, okay? So when we see this again, this eye type is very prone to having some food allergies and we see that predisposition here as we look at how all these markers play together. But the food allergies might not be true allergies. They might be reactions to poorly digested food. And so we need to support this person's digestion. 
Um, Pam says she has a biliary iris and she has Hashimoto's. There you go. There you go. And so when we look at this, we need to think about what would we do? What are some of the things on our short list? And we are, we're never going to take an idea from the short list and give it to the client until we've asked enough questions to clarify, right? Remember that the, everything we're doing has to circle around what their symptoms are and what their eyes are telling us and how those work together, what questions they trigger in us and the answers our client gives us. Here is another beautiful biliary eye. So in this one, and in this one, okay, so Pam was also saying, I thought thyroid would be with the blue iris. So Pamela, here's the thing. We would need to see your eyes on your natural light to see if they're truly biliary or if they are actually lymphatic with a lot of brown. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, um, the eyes give us indicators, but they don't give us absolutes and guarantees. So it might be that you have, with Hashimoto's, it's an autoimmune, but you might have a genetic predisposition to it, or it might be that you've actually created, created it yourself through diet, lifestyle, and um, how, how you're raised emotions and how you think, things like that. And so it's not to say blaming anybody, it's just saying sometimes that's how things play together. And so we do see things like Hashimoto's uh, happening in people with different eye types beyond the lymphatic. Okay. But it's also a common mistake to look at a hematic, or sorry, a biliary eye and to, and to say that it is absolutely biliary because in many cases it's really a lymphatic with a lot of brown. Okay, so there's a lot of, of nuances that we would have to work with. Uh, good technology to get good eye photos or good natural lighting with great magnification. Biliary, uh, this is an answer for yoga. Biliary is its own constitution. It is not a subtype of hematogenic. It is totally on its own. Okay. All right. So back to the biliary eye. So this is a slightly lighter biliary eye iris than the first one we looked at. But we do have, notice that in here, now those of you on Instagram might not be able to see this. Those of you that are on the webinar, can you see that there's a teensy weensy shadow of a crease right here? If you can see that, let me know. Just right straight up from my pointer here, can you see this? Yes, yes, thanks Joanne. I'm glad you can see that. That is one of these in the nutritive zone. So these talk about how the body deals with stress, how it burns through B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium. It says the same thing right here, but it says that that digestive, the digestive areas of the body are very prone to getting stressed. Oh, and Madeline could even see that on here. Good, that's awesome. So when we see that, we know that we're going to need to be really supporting the nervous or the, the digestive areas, but we're going to need to support them in different ways than we normally would. We're going to need to support them with building the nervous system as opposed to necessarily building enzymes. All right, that's, so that's why we can't just do one mark means one thing, right? We need to look at how they all play together. So with this, again, we've got the, with the brown in here, we've got that strong liver undercurrent. I love milk thistle for that. I also love N-acetylcysteine. Now what we're doing is not gonna change the eye color. That is not the object of this exercise. What we're doing is to support the liver to deal with phase one and phase two detox appropriately. Okay, and that's a part of the reason why I don't detox people. I work with their diet and I will often just do a little bit of support for the liver to help it do its, its job better. This person may also have problems with their metabolism based on what we're seeing here. They've got some slight potentials for issues with their skin, but that might be dealt with as we support the kidneys. We've got a lot of kidney color in this eye as well. We've got the potential for poor circulation, for sluggish circulation. That can be a circulatory issue or it can be an adrenal gland issue. And so we have to look at other markings. Is there a history of circulatory problems? Is there a history of adrenal problems? Uh, before we decide, how are we going to support this? If it's even a concern for the client. 
okay? And so um, when, we, when we see these marks, we've got to be able to, to tie them together. And that's what we need to teach. Not just one marking means one thing. We need to understand how everything weaves together. All right, so can you see how having this kind of an insight of how all these marks, markers play together can really give you depth to the work that you do with your clients? Can you see that? Yeah? Awesome. Let's do a quick little case study. So you can see how this works actually in a clinical situation. This is um, a client of mine, obviously. Let me just wet my whistle here. In her early 20s, she's just graduated from university about a year ago with a teaching degree. And she came in um, with complaining of, or wanting help with would be a better way. She struggles with anxiety and depression and gut issues. She can have um, really intense gut cramps and bloating. And she's, um, she was concerned because she'd just gotten her first professional placement. She was going into the classroom and she wanted to be her best. And I just love that, that she was preparing herself to be the best for the kids. And so as we're talking, and I'm, she's a school teacher, she's got her, her, her first placement. I'm looking at her eyes, I'm going, hmm. So I asked her, what is your area of specialty? Because as you know, in education, there's lots of uh, specialized areas. She said, well, special ed. I said, ooh, cool, what, what kind of special ed? She says, well, I like working with autistic children. I went, oh my goodness, could there be a more perfect fit on the face of the planet than for you to work with autistic children? And she said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I see from how this is placed that you are an introvert. When you did your student teaching, did you have to student teach in classrooms of 30 students? And she said, yes, I did. And I said, how'd that go? And she said, it was hard. I said, did you do some practicum work also with special ed in classes where you have work, only had to work with two or three students? And she said, yes. I said, how'd that go? She said, oh my goodness, I loved it to pieces. I loved it forever. Great. Total introvert, doesn't like the crowds, doesn't like the noise, likes working one-on-one, -on -one, likes small groups, right? And then I noticed that she had these markers, which tell us many, many things, but they also tell us she's creative. And I asked her, do you, which do you find to be more creative, the big class or the autistic kids? And she said, oh, the autistic kids by a long shot. She said, I have to think way outside the box to figure out ways to reach these kids, ways to connect with them. I said, well, you've got it. You've got it. What we need to do now is settle your gut so you could really enjoy this. And so as we look, we see that, yeah, she's totally prone to internalizing everything emotionally, to holding things tight in her gut. So we've really done some work with her, worked with her diet to make sure she's eating foods that are easy to digest first off, making sure she's got her proteins balanced so she's got her blood sugar stable, and working with digestive support so that she doesn't bloat with gas because that's just nasty and it's uncomfortable, right? How do you think when you're bloated with painful gas? and worked with things for the anxiety and the depression. Not that we can treat disease processes if we're not licensed practitioners, but use things that we know historically can ease anxiety and ease depression. And she's had a marvelous first year in the classroom. Absolutely marvelous. And she's looking so forward to her second year because she feels great. She feels better than she did in university. She's doing great with sticking to the recommendation. So actually what we did in her first appointment, we used some GABA, we used some N-acetylcysteine, some passion flower, some methylated B complex, and we got her to make sure she was being active every day, at least going for a 30 minute walk. She also likes spin classes and things like that. So just 30 minutes every day, something to clear her head and to kind of burn off the day. In her second appointment about a month later, as she was actually preparing to head into the classroom, so she was smart. She came in early in the summer, right before she went into the classroom for her first year. If you know anything about first year teachers, they're sick all the time because the kids bring in so many colds and things and the teachers are run down and they're under stress and their immune systems kind of cave. So they're sick like six or eight times in the first year. 
but we knew that she was going into that knowing her history with anxiety and depression we supported her with a herbal product from Nature Sunshine called SNX, which I think is called Sinus Support in the US. And we added to her program something called Serenity in, in Nature Sunshine USA, it's called Anxiousless. We also suggested that she add to her program so that she could walk three or four times a week, but I wanted her getting some resistance training in as well, because that's another great way to be burning off stress. And she did, um, she did those things and she's, just had such a great start to this year. This is her second year, or that was her first year, sorry. She had a great first year, as I mentioned, she didn't get sick at all, never had a cold, right? And just felt so good. She's going into her second year and we're really excited for her potential here. So with all of that, I would love it if I could have your permission to take just three minutes, I promise it won't be more than three, to introduce to you the course that's coming up. And it is called Confident Nutritionist, the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System. This is truly the only live, online, fully mentored iridology program for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths, and other holistic practitioners too, who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. So often when people talk about spending less time with a the client, they really mean give your client less, cheat them out of things, and this is actually a way to give them more but take less time and to be more accurate with what you give them. And I teach this program specifically so that the practitioners can stop using, putting in unpaid overtime to create programs. So they can create programs that will not overwhelm their clients. So that it will increase client compliance because that means that the client's gonna get better results. So it increases their success and it increases their long-term retention, right? Clients don't get results if they only come in once or twice. They get results as we coach them step by step. I've got clients now that have been with me for 38 years. I've got clients now where we're on the third generation of the family because we built their program step by step. And of course, what it means is we see them five or six times, usually within about a six month period, then they know enough and they're feeling great enough that they go off for a while. Five or six years later, when their bodies start to change, they come back because, golly, something has slipped. And we rebuild, we do five or six appointments, get them all put back together, get them working well, send them off again. And so as they need me, they come back. But as long as they're doing well, they don't need to come back. It's about teaching the clients what they need to know, but in a way that they can actually manage it perfectly fine. The goal of Confident Nutritionist is to, again, to teach you constitutional iridology. It's also to teach you how to use it and to integrate what you already know. So to tie in the nutrition, the herbology, the aromatherapy, the flower essences, whatever your modalities are, this is about teaching you how to do the iridology, understand how all the markings work, and draw on all of the trainings you've already got to create those programs that can be very, very helpful. Now I'm gonna pop back here. I'm hoping I updated this link. I think I did. I hope I did. And I'm just gonna bring this back down here because we are doing a, oh, I didn't, here's the new one. This is the one we want. Good job. Okay, so we're doing an info webinar on this. I'm not selling you a program right now, that's for sure. But if you wanna know more, and if you want to know, um, if you want like three very specific things that you can start doing in your business right now, even without knowing iridology, I'm going to invite you to join me for a webinar. And here is the incredibly long link for it. You can click on that. The webinar will be Wednesday, September 23rd at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. And we're gonna talk about all the ins and the outs of the program, who it's for, uh, how it can help you, how it will benefit your clients, how the program is delivered, uh, what kind of mentoring and support will you receive when you're in the program, what is the tuition, is there a payment plan, everything. We cover all of that in this, this webinar coming up on the 23rd at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Those of you who are not in the Mountain Time Zone, it is now 12 noon here roughly. You can calculate your time. The next course starts on Wednesday, October 7th. So if you're interested, you might want to mark that off as a start date. 
and feel free then to hop on over to this link and get registered for the webinar uh, to learn more about the program. Alrighty, so just wondering if there's any other questions that I can help you with. If there's anything about iridology or any little ticklers about the course that's coming up that you would like to know. And we'll give everybody just a few seconds to weigh in on that. Actually, I see we've got one of the students who's already registered for the class has joined us on the webinar. She joined us quite a while ago and I just comment on that right now. Right. I do keep the classes small, so you're not going to be in a class of 100 because that would not be good for your learning. I'm not seeing any other questions come in. I just want to thank you so much for being with me today. I hope that worked. Um, I'm wondering how we integrate this in at this time. Oh, Joanne, so you're meaning if you can't work face to face with your clients, how do you actually do their eyes, right? Yeah. Okay. So considering the restrictions, if you are not in a situation where you can work face to face with clients, I've added some content to the program to help you coach clients over Zoom or over the internet for how they can get decent, not great, but decent and usable eye photos with their smartphones. And if they can get decent photos with their smartphones that they can share with you, then you can do their appointments over Zoom, right? So we have ways, I've had clients that have done that, especially when we were in hard lockdown. We're not in hard lockdown anymore, and so I'm good seeing clients face to face if they want to. And, um, and so those that are, however, are distanced, I coach them um, with a little video I've made, which I share with you when you're my student, and um, you know, through emails and so on, on how to get decent eye photos. Again, they're not the quality you've been looking at in our webinar today, but they're good enough to start with. And when lockdown is over, when you can actually see people again, you will be able to hit the floor running to do this face to face. All right, so that's a great question, Joanne. Any other questions? All right. Oh, do we need to purchase a special camera? Not at the beginning, Joanne. In fact, I slap my students' fingers if I catch them saying, I think I'm buying a camera because you don't know if you love this. And why would you want to spend $4,000 on a piece of equipment if you don't know you're going to love it? Right? So we actually go over what you need. Initially, you need about $50 worth of equipment beyond the class. And that's it. And then, you know, I've got students that have graduated that they're saving their money to buy a camera. And I think that's a smart way to do it. And I'll give you tips on how to save the money as well. Yeah, so do you need to buy a special camera? Eventually, it's helpful if you want to do this professionally, but not at the outset. Like, don't spend $4,000. Don't even spend $200 on an iriscope. Don't buy a phony little pretend thing. Let's just start where we need to start. We'll jump over the phony equipment and get to the real equipment when you're ready, all right? And I don't even sell the equipment, so this isn't a plug for me, okay? All righty, perfect. Anything else? All right, well, I'm hoping that you've grabbed that link and that you're joining me on Wednesday the 23rd at 5 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time to learn more about the program. And I hope you've enjoyed what you've learned today and I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much for being with me. Talk to you later. Bye for now.